Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel, or if you're new here, welcome, hello. In today's video, I'll be talking about some new releases coming out in January that I am super excited for. The majority of the books that I mention are going to be thrillers, horror, sometimes sci-fi. So we are going to start off the year with a bang. There are some books I'm going to talk about that I'm highly anticipating. Also, I asked my sister if she could make me a graphic for book of the month picks, because sometimes the book of the month picks will release before the first of the month. If that happens and they do post early, I'll make sure to add this little graphic. <laughs> She's so adorable. I told her, can you just make something that says book of the month with stars around it? And then this is what she came up with. So with that aside, I hope everyone had a safe and happy New Year's Eve. And I hope we all have an incredible reading year this year. Let's all manifest a year where all of our books are good and none of our favorite authors get canceled. So the first books I'm going to talk about are coming out January 2nd. The first one is called First Lie Wins by Ashley Elston. Evie Porter has everything a nice southern girl Girl could want. A perfect doting boyfriend, a house with a white picket fence and a garden, a fancy group of friends. The only catch? Evie Porter doesn't exist. The identity comes first. Evie Porter. Once she's given a name and location by her mysterious boss, Mr. Smith, she learns everything there is to know about the town and the people in it. Then the target. Ryan Sumner. The last piece of the puzzle is the job. Evie isn't privy to Mr. Smith's real identity, but she knows this job will be different. Ryan has gotten under her skin, and she's starting to envision a different sort of life for herself. But Evie can't make any mistakes, especially after what happened last time. Because the one thing she's worked her entire life to keep clean, the one identity she could always go back to, her real identity, just walked into this town. Evie Porter must stay one step ahead of her past while making sure there's still a future in front of her. The stakes couldn't be higher, but Evie has always liked a challenge. So it looks like this is gonna be part psychological thriller and maybe part cat and mouse. We have Evie, who is a con woman, when all of a sudden her real identity, the one thing she can always fall back on, walks into town. So it's kind of like that Spider-Man meme where they're all pointing at each other, like what's going on? Why are there so many con artists in this one town? Next up is Anna O by Matthew Blake. What if your nightmares weren't really nightmares at all? We spend an average of 33 years of our lives asleep, but what really happens and what are we capable of when we are sleeping? Anna was a budding 25 year old writer with a bright future. Then one night she stabbed two people to death with no apparent motive and she hasn't woken up since. Dubbed Sleeping Beauty by the tabloids, Anna suffers from a rare psychosomatic disorder known to neurologists as resignation syndrome. Dr. Benedict Prince is a forensic psychologist and an expert in the field of sleep-related homicides. His methods represent the last possible hope of solving the infamous Anna O case by waking Anna up so she can stay in trial. But the doctor must be careful treating such a high-profile suspect. He's got career secrets and a complicated personal life of his own. As Anna shows the first signs of stirring, Benedict knows he must determine what really happened and whether Anna should be held responsible for her crimes. Only Anna knows the truth about that at night, but only Benedict knows how to discover it, and they're both in danger from what they will discover. When I first read this summary, I immediately thought of The Silent Patient by Alex McElides. I really, really liked that one. So obviously the similarities between a person snapping and killing someone for apparently no reason, and then post-murder they're left in a state where they can't talk or won't talk. So I really like the premise of that. Read some of the reviews and saw that already this is not going to be for everyone. The main complaints I could see were that it drags. It's 432 pages, which I agree that is a little bit too long for me. Just personally, I like my thrillers to be a little bit shorter so they can remain fast paced. Also, there's a lot of Harry Potter references for some reason in this book. And lastly, and probably the most important one, is there is an animal death in this one. So I know with a lot of people, if you hurt the animal, if you touch the animal, if you look at the animal mean, that's a big no, it's a red flag, stay away. So just know that before picking this book up. Next, we have a fast paced thriller called The Ascent by Adam Platinga, and this is his debut novel. Do you hear the birds? The birds are going crazy outside. <laughs> this doesn't even sound real. It's like, am I in the simulation? Because they're going crazy. When a high security prison fails, a down his luck cop and the governor's daughter are going to have to team up if they're going to escape. 
Kurt Argento is an ex-Detroit street cop who can't let injustice go, and he has the fighting skills to back up his idealism. If he sees a young girl being dragged into an alley, he's gonna rescue her and cause some damage. When he does just that in a small, corrupt Missouri town, he's brutally beaten and thrown into a maximum security prison. Julie Wakefield is a grad student who happens to be the governor's daughter. She's about to take a tour of the prison, but when a malfunction in the security system releases a horde of prisoners, a fierce struggle for survival ensues. Argento must help a small band of staff and civilians, including Julie and her two state trooper handlers, make their way from the bottom floor to the roof to safety. All that stands in their way are six floors of the most dangerous convicts in Missouri. So I don't tend to gravitate towards books like this, but that premise is so scary to me. With some of the reviews I read, it doesn't look like he is going to pull any punches. You're going to read about the dark side of the police force, the dirty side of it, and and the dark side of the prison. And I really feel like our two main characters are gonna be Kurt and Julie. And there are some side characters also thrown in there, you know, staff, civilians, the state troopers. I feel like those are gonna be the characters that are gonna get picked off. That's what really has my attention, just knowing that I don't think it's gonna be this light read where everyone makes it to the top. There's just no way. Six floors of maximum security prisoners. Yeah! Also, Platinga has 22 years of law enforcement experience. So I think that will really help with the believability of this plot. He should know the ins and outs, the lingo used. These next couple release January 9th. The first one is by Rachel Hawkins. She's the author of The Wife Upstairs, Reckless Girls, The Villa, and this one is called The Heiress. The little tagline says there's nothing as good as the rich gone bad and you know what that means say it with me rich people drama <laughs> Rich people drama usually ain't got nothing to do with me. That's none of my business. But this plot sounds actually really good. It says when Ruby, McTavish, Callahan, Woodward, Miller, Kenmore dies, she's not only North Carolina's richest woman, she's also its most notorious. The victim of a famous kidnapping as a child and a widow four times over, Ruby ruled the tiny town of Tavistock from Ashby House her family's estate high in the Blue Ridge Mountains. In the aftermath of her death, that estate, along with the nine-figure fortune and the complicated legacy of being a McTavish, passed to her adopted son, Camden. But to everyone's surprise, Cam wants little to do with the house or the money, and even less to do with the surviving McTavishes. Instead, he rejects his inheritance, settling into a normal life as an English teacher in Colorado and marrying Jules, a woman just as eager to escape her own messy past. Ten years later, Camden is McTavish in name only, but a summons in the wake of his uncle's death brings him and Jules back into the family fold at Ashby House. Its views are just as stunning as ever, its rooms just as elegant, but coming home reminds Cam why he was so quick to leave in the first place. Jules, however, has other ideas, and the more she learns about Cam's estranged family, and the twisted secrets they keep, the more determined she is for her husband to claim everything Ruby once intended for him to have. But Ruby's plans were always more complicated than they appeared. As Ashby House tightens its grip on Jules and Camden, questions about the infamous heiress come to light. Was there any truth to the persistent rumors following her disappearance as a girl? What really happened to those four husbands who all died under mysterious circumstances? And why did she adopt Cam in the first place? Soon, Jules and Cam realize that an inheritance can entail far more than what's written in the will, and that the bonds of family stretch far beyond the grave. Next up is a psychological thriller called What Mother Won't Tell Me by Ivar Leon Menger. This is the translated version. It was originally published in 2022 in German. So Menger is not just an author. He's also a highly talented director. He did a beautiful book trailer for this book. So I'll link that down below. Deep in the forests of Nordland in a cabin on a small island, Juno has lived in almost complete isolation since early childhood. She has only mother, father and her little brother boy for company. They live in constant fear because danger lurks on the other side of the lake, seeking them out. Strangers, as they call them, who want to take revenge on their father and destroy the family. They live safely under seven strict commandments until everything changes. When Juno is spotted by a stranger, she sets in motion a chain of frightening events. And in an increasingly threatening new reality, she starts to suspect that more than a few secrets have been kept from her. 
She doesn't know who her parents are at all, and she doesn't know herself. But whoever mother and father are, they'll do anything to keep Juno to themselves. On to January 16th. The first one is called The Search Party by Hannah Richel. Max and Annie Kingsley have left the London rat race with their 12-year-old son to set up a glamping site in the wilds of Cornwall. Eager for a dry run ahead of their opening, they invite three old university friends and their families for a long-needed reunion. But the festivities soon go awry as tensions arise between the children and subsequently the parents. Explosive secrets come to light and a sudden storm moves in, cutting them off from help as one in the group disappears. Moving between the police investigation, a hospital room, and the catastrophic weekend, The Search Party is a propulsive and twisty destination thriller about the tenuous bonds of friendship and the links parents will go to protect their children. Are you kidding? Was this made for me? Because I think it was. I really can't wait for this one. And I love how it tells us we're going to be jumping around. So we're going to have the police investigation. Obviously, that will be in the present. A hospital room, probably still in the present. Who's there? And then back in the past, following, I'm sure, the start of that trip to whenever it goes horribly wrong. This sounds so good. And so far, it has some pretty decent reviews. Next up, we have one of my highly anticipated reads for 2024 in general. And this will be a January 2024 book of the month pick. Where's my little graphic? It's called Only If You're Lucky by Stacey Willingham. She's the author of A Flicker in the Dark and All the Dangerous Things. I've read both of those novels and I feel like she's a very reliable author. She's just really a really solid thriller writer. I think she is good for newbies or if you're someone like me and you just read absolutely every thriller you can. It says Lucy Sharp is larger than life, magnetic, addictive, bold, and dangerous, especially for Margot, who meets Lucy at the end of their freshman year at a liberal arts college in South Carolina. Margot is the shy one, the careful one, always the sidekick and never the center of attention. But when Lucy singles her out at the end of the year, a year Margot spent studying and playing it safe, and asks her to room together, something in Margot can't say no. Something daring, or starved, or maybe even envious. And so Margot finds herself living in an off-campus house with three other girls. Lucy, the ringleader, Sloane, the sarcastic one, and Nicole, the nice one. The three of them opposites, but also deeply intertwined. It's a year that finds Margot finally coming out of the shell she's been in since the end of high school, when her best friend Eliza died three weeks after graduation. Margot and Lucy have become the closest of friends, but by the middle of their sophomore year, one of the fraternity boys from the house next door has been brutally murdered, and Lucy Sharp is missing without a trace. A tantalizing thriller about the nature of friendship and belonging, about loyalty, envy, and betrayal. Another book that is an insta ad to my January book of the month box is The Fury by Alex Michaelides. I swear it feels like every book he does is something different than the last one. It's he's I love that. But it has been over two years since he released The Maiden, so I am so ready to dive into this one. This is a tale of murder, or maybe that's not quite true. At its heart, it's a love story, isn't it? Lana is a reclusive ex-movie star and one of the most famous women in the world. Every year, she invites her closest friends to escape the English weather and spend Easter on her idyllic private Greek island. I tell you this because you may think you know this story. You probably read about it at the time. It caused a real stir in the tabloids, if you remember. It had all the necessary ingredients for the press. A celebrity, private island cut off by the winds, and a murder. We found ourselves trapped there overnight. Our old friendships concealed hatred and a desire for revenge. What followed was a game of cat and mouse, a battle of wits full of twists and turns, building to an unforgettable climax. The night ended in violence and death, as one of us was found murdered. But who am I? My name is Elliot Chase, and I'm going to tell you a story unlike any you've ever heard. Elliot Chase is actually a playwright, so he's gonna be telling this story over five acts. That already sounds incredible. Then we have the trapped on an island trope, which sold. But then it seems like it's gonna be told in this super unique way, which one of my top books of the year for 2023 was Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone. That main character broke the fourth wall with us and was telling us a story. And it feels like that's what's happening here. Y'all do not understand. Just to know that I'm gonna have this book in my hand very shortly. 
And lastly for January 16th is Where You End by Abbott Collar. From best-selling nonfiction author Abbott Collar comes a spellbinding fiction debut inspired by true events. An unusual form of amnesia upends the lives of identical twins, forcing them to face the dangerous shadows of the past. When 22-year-old Cat Bird wakes up from a coma, she sees her mirror image, Jude, her twin sister. Jude's face and name are the only memories Cat has from before her accident. As Cat tries to relearn her history and identity, she trusts Jude will provide all the answers. But as the months progress, Cat begins to fear that maybe Jude has been lying to her. Growing up in a sophisticated new age cult, isolated from society, the girls study poetry and literature, but also play dangerous games of cunning and savagery. Games with dark lessons that followed them into adulthood. Now with Cat's mind as a blank slate, Jude invents an idyllic childhood in the hope of erasing this history and all the threats it still holds. As Cat pulls at the threads of Jude's elaborate tapestry, those threats draw closer. When the past and present finally converge, the twins must risk everything to save both their unique bond and each other's lives. Um, I definitely need to look into that one more and figure out what true events inspired that novel. Definitely has the cult vibe. That one just sounds super cool. Next up, these come out January 23rd. The first one is called No One Can Know by Kate Alice Marshall. This was an early release, so I got this one in December. I really enjoyed her debut novel, What Lies in the Woods. It was a great thriller, solid writing, solid characters. So I'm really looking forward to finally digging into this one. Emma hasn't told her husband much about her past. He knows her parents are dead and she hasn't spoken to her sisters in years. Then they lose their apartment. Her husband gets laid off and Emma discovers she's pregnant right as the bank account slips into the red. That's when Emma confesses that she has one more asset her parents' house, which she owns jointly with her estranged sisters. They can't sell it, but they can live in it. But returning home means that Emma is forced to reveal her secrets to her husband, that the house is not a rundown farmhouse, but a stately mansion, and that her parents died there, or more accurately, where they were murdered, and that some people say Emma did it. Maybe tell it to your husband, like, before y'all get married, I don't know. Emma and her sisters have never spoken about what really happened that night. Now, her return to the house may lure her sisters back, but it will also crack open family and small town secrets lots of people don't want revealed. As Emma struggles to reconnect with her old family and hold together her new one, she begins to realize that the things they have left unspoken all these years have put them in danger again. Unsolved murder, the bond of sisters that is now fractured. Is it fractured because they think Emma killed their parents? Small towns, hidden secrets. That's the recipe for a great book in my opinion. Next is The Clinic by Kate Quinn. Meg works for a casino in LA catching cheaters and popping a few too many pain pills to cope, following a far different path than her sister Haley, a famous actress. But suddenly reports surface of Haley dying at the remote rehab facility where she had been forced to go to get her addictions under control. There are whispers of suicide, but Meg can't believe it. She decides that the best way to find out what happened to her sister is to check in herself to investigate what really happened from the inside. Battling her own addictions and figuring out the truth will be much more difficult than she imagined, far away from friends, family, and anyone who could help her. This is around 448 pages. I saw that it has a slower start, but luckily the chapters are apparently short. We are getting two point of views. We're getting Meg, who is checking herself into this rehab facility to try and investigate from the inside. And then we're gonna be following the woman that oversees the rehab facility. So the author is open about her own sobriety and even used her experience in rehab to write this. So that's incredible to me. You take something super personal, her taking something super personal and turning it into something, <laughs> turning it into a murder mystery that can actually maybe even teach us a few things about the ins and outs of rehab and what some of these people have to go through. Final two are coming out January 30th. The first one is by an author that I desperately need to read more from and that is Christopher Golden. So this is his newest release called The House of Last Resort. 
Across Italy, there are many half-empty towns, nearly abandoned by those who migrate to the coast or to cities. The beautiful, crumbling hilltop town of Bikina is among them, but its mayor has taken drastic measures to rebuild, selling abandoned homes to anyone in the world for a single euro, as long as the buyer promises to live there for at least five years. In this housing market, sir, I'll take five. It's a no-brainer for American couple Tommy and Kate. Both work remotely, and Bikina is the home of Tommy's grandparents. His closest living relatives. It feels like a romantic adventure, an opportunity the young couple would be crazy not to seize. But from the moment they move in, they both feel a shadow has fallen on them. Tommy's grandmother is furious, even a little frightened when she realizes which house they bought. There are rooms in an annex in the back of the house that they didn't know were there. The place makes strange noises at night. Locked doors are suddenly open, and when they go to a family gathering, there are certain people are whispering about them and about their house, which one neighbor refers to as the house of last resort. Soon, they learn that the home was owned for generations by the church. But the real secret and the true dread is unlocked when they finally learn what the priests were doing in this house for all those long years, and how many people died in the strange chapel inside. While down in the catacombs beneath Bikina, something stirs. That might be my first horror read of the new year. Lastly, we have The Mountain King by Anders de la Motte. This was originally published in Swedish, but is getting its English translation. I saw this described as Nordic Noir, which is a subgenre I didn't realize I needed so desperately. Criminal inspector Leonor, Asker, or Leo for short, seems to have the leading position at Malma's major crime division within reach. But things go awry when in the middle of a high profile kidnapping case, management relegates her to the so-called Department of Lost Souls, the unit for odd cold cases banished to the basement of the police station. Despite the humiliation, Asker is drawn into one of the more peculiar cases. Someone is placing small, ominous figures in town, and one of them seems to represent the missing woman from the kidnapping case. As Asker's investigation takes her to abandoned buildings, she reaches out to a local architecture expert, and together they explore the sinister recesses of the city and discover that an unusual kind of evil lurks in the shadows. So immediately, I'm drawn to to our main character, Leo. She's being thrown into this new department, into this department called the Department of Lost Souls, which I just think about Mulder and Scully. Scully having to shadow Mulder and going into this weird department with weird cases. It's kind of like Leo now having to look at odd cases and then her case being connected to the case that she was looking into before she had to come into this new department. It just sounds so interesting. This is also number one in the series so it looks like maybe we will be following her along on new cases. Hopefully they are all in this department of lost souls, these unique cases that are not solved. So those are all the books I'm looking forward to. I do try to hit most of the major releases that I can see, but of course I am going to miss some. So if there are any books that you're looking forward to that I didn't talk about, let me know, put them on my radar. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Y'all take care and I will see you in my next video.